So it's a privilege to be here and to open up the Word of God and just talk about the things of God. It's such a privilege. And um, I'll try to introduce myself a little bit. We'll get acquainted and whatnot. But one of the things I remember about Ben, Ben was raised pretty much house next door to me on the north. And Angie's best friend was house just south of me. So, so, and what Ben used to do is he used to help out the Angie's best friend's parents when they were out of town. What, did, they, did you feed their horses? And, and did water their plants and whatnot. So, so one day I'm, I'm looking out the front window, look, and here comes Ben walking down to do his chores um, at the neighbor's house, and he's just going like this. And I said, that guy's preaching, you know, he was just, you know, he's just going, on, going after it, you know. And I thought, way to go, you go, Ben, you know. It was awesome. And uh, um, so who knew he'd, he'd turn out to be a preacher? And, and a very good one at that. I'm blessed to be here and to be a part of what we're doing here. I don't know about you, what you're picking up from the Spirit of God lately, but me, I'm picking up God wants more from us. God wants more um, in our lives. We're the body of Christ, right? Hello? Are we the body of Christ? Yes. Okay. So I just, let's make sure I'm in the right place. So we're the body of Christ, right? And you know, what's great about Jesus, when you think about it, no matter what room he went into, after he left, that room was changed. Can you imagine hanging out with Jesus? You know, and going, oh, you know, what do you do today? Well, yeah, we're going by the pool of Bethesda today, and you know that guy was waiting for the water to get troubled, and yeah, yeah, Jesus just walked up and healed the guy. You know, and Jesus would walk, hey, you remember that guy who used to poke fun of blind Bartimaeus? Yeah, Jesus walked by him and healed him. Jesus changed. He was an agent of change. And I believe that God is wanting us to do the same. Amen? So let's pray and let's get into the Word and see what the Spirit of God has to say. Father, we thank you for your Word today. We ask for an anointing. Anointing to preach it, to teach it, and anointing to hear it. Enable me to communicate effectively in, in, in a manner that represents you well, Lord, Lord God. Help us to learn from the stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We love your word, Lord Jesus. We love to walk in your word. We love to grow in your word. We just pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, there's, a, there's a, um, a sea called Galilee. It's more like a lake. If you ever looked at a place in Jerusalem, or not Jerusalem, but Israel, there's a, they call it the Sea of Galilee, but it's a lake of Galilee. It's more like you know, make Coeur d'Alene Lake or something. It's not a real big lake, maybe a little bit bigger. But on the, on the um, east side of the lake, is a, is, it goes up to, to into some hills, and on the top of that hill, there used to be a town, a Roman town. It was a part of the Acropolis, they call it. It was called Hippos. And Hippos was a beautiful town, it had paved streets, columns, and it was actually a, a Roman center that would print Roman currency for the, the local people. And what the Romans would do is they would come into different regions that they were, they were possessing, and they wouldn't strong arm them. What they would do is they would turn them into Romans through culture. So, so he... So they, they would come, they would see the nice cities and everything like that, and they would persuade them. There was 10, 10 cities in Israel that, that kind of like model cities, they go through a, a housing development, model homes. There they had model cities to try to influence the people into the culture of Rome. That way the people wouldn't fight them. So God is calling us, with that said, God is calling us to change culture. I like the group called Jesus Culture. And I like that term, Jesus Culture. And, and, I, and I believe that we need to start thinking of ourselves as Jesus Culture. Not churchgoers, culture that goes in and persuades 
and, and disciples people, like Jesus said, go into all the world and disciple nations. So, so think of yourself as, as God's representative in the world to change culture. And, and there was a time back in the 70s, I remember the Jesus People Movement. Is there, was anybody in the Jesus People Movement? They, they actually changed cultures. They, I mean, when the Doobie Brothers came out and said, Jesus is all right with me, that was, that was, that was, a, that was a secular group changed by the Jesus people. So, so I believe that we're in that season again to be Jesus people again and change our culture. Not have culture change us. We don't want to be, the church for too long has been modern culture light. Like, like you know, it's, it's a salad dressing that they take out the bad stuff and they call it light. So modern, <laughs> modern culture minus the sin. And we've kind of been doing that, but we're, are we effective? You know, are we effective? I want to be effective for Jesus. I want to be the person who goes into the room and leaves it changed. Amen. Jesus changed everywhere he went. He, the place didn't stay the same after he went there. He changed it. And we, we can do that through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. We don't have to fabricate it. This is not a works thing. This is by grace. This is simply being where God puts us at the right place, at the right time. And that's where we start our story. So, <clears throat> the story starts with the Hebrew children. There was one called Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, the, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was their Babylonian name. But at that time, the way they got into Babylon instead of Israel, Judah specifically, was they had disobeyed God. The nation had disobeyed God, and God told them back in Deuteronomy through the mouth of Moses, if you disobey me, other people will come and take you captive. And they found themselves in that situation. So you got these three boys, they're homeless Hebrew boys. They're going into a foreign land, just who knows what they're going to do, right? Who knows what they're going to do? And, and so... So the king says, okay, we need, some, we need the bright, brightest and best. We want some good-looking guys. We want some smart guys. Let them go through this course, three-year course. Into the three-year course, we'll put them, we'll see if they make the mustard, cut the mustard. So, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego qualified through the Babylon's Got Talent show or whatever they had. <laughs> so... So they, 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 get the, they, they get passed through. They're mixed in with the, with the soothsayers, the magicians, and the guys that can interpret dreams, and the guys that just know stuff. Back then, you couldn't Google things, so the king would have men that knew things. So if he wanted to know something, he would go to the people who, who were the Google of the time. They couldn't Google it. So he would... So when they had a, a certain situation, hey, I want my guys to come and tell me this and that, the other thing. So God gives this king named Nebuchadnezzar this profounding dream of the future. You know, God can use through, go work through people who don't know him. So, so Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. It was a profound dream. And so he says, well, hey, I got all these wise men. I got these magicians. I got these conjurers. I want them to tell me what I dreamt. I don't, I'm not going to tell my dream. They're going to tell me what I dreamt. And so they, he gets all of his guys, to, and they say, he says, hey, tell me what I dreamt. And if you don't, I'm going to tear you from limb to limb and bulldoze your house in. <laughs> and they say, whoa, time out. Time out, you know, nobody can... Can, can tell you, only God could do that, and we're not God, so we can't do that. He says, you know what? You got, I'm going to just tear you from Lindem Lynn and bulldoze your house in. And so the, the news gets back to Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and so Daniel says, wait a second, let me see the king, let me talk to him. So he goes to the king, he says, there is a God in heaven, and God, give us time, 
I'll go back to my people and we'll tell you, the next day we'll tell you what, what, what you dreamt. Can you imagine that? Tell me what you dreamt. Are you kidding me? But that, you know, it's like, well, okay. So he goes back to his people and they get together, they pray, and God gives Daniel the dream. He goes, he tells them what the dream was. He tells them the interpretation of the dream. And it has to do with the future. It was a, it was a future dream about different kingdoms down, down to our present day. And so anyway, King says, cool, you're, you're prime minister. And you know what? You can, you can have your boys. Your crew can be your, your administrative staff. So they go from ho homeless Hebrew boys to being a prime minister and having a pretty, pretty nice career going for themselves. And that's God. That is God. Only God can do that. You know, and, and we can expect that. But I want to talk about your people. Daniel had his people. And how important to have a crew, have your people, have your guys you go to to pray with. The, the, you know, two or three people the book of Ecclesiastes says a threefold cord is not easily broken. Of course, we know Jesus is one of those cords. But have your people. Do you have your people today? We have a community here, but inside of our community, we also have people. Jesus had people. He had, he had James, John, Peter, and he would go with them, and they would do special, special things. Having your people is very important. Very important. So, so if you don't have people, get people. <laughs> pray, pray that God will show you. You know, I go, to, I go to, sometimes I'll go to recovery, and I can see they got people. They, got, they have to have people. What they're coming out of, they got to have people. And we need, we need people in our lives to help us out because you don't know what you're, what you're going through. And, and so I was, I was reflecting on people and, and, and the things that I've gone through in my life that I needed my people. One time that I was, um, I was 38 years old. You don't mind me talking about myself, do you? Yeah. Kind of, you kind of get a little bit shaky. Eh, I don't want to talk about myself. But sometimes that's the only example you can use. So anyway, I'm going to use myself as an example so you can know to have people. So anyway, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm 38 years old about, no, 35 years old, <clears throat> and my wife at the time is diagnosed with terminal cancer. Brain cancer, inoperable cancer. Got four kids. Got four kids. And, and, and no, the prospects don't look good. Uh, now I believe God is for healing. I've always believed, believed that. She passed away. For whatever reason, we'll find out when we go to heaven. So that's not on that. But during that time, I had people. People in the church gather around me, prop me up. I was talking to Buzz Turk. Buzz, you got the best name, Buzz Turk. <laughs> it's a great name. So I, I wish I had a name like that, like <laughs> Buzz Lightyear, you know. <laughs> Buzz Turk. So, so Buzz Turk. And were you married at the time? Yes. To, and anyway, so so he he takes David, who is right there, who's only like two or three years old. And, and while I'm struggling with, with my wife who's going through the throes of, of the time that it takes, you know, having cancer and all that kind of... So he takes them down to the river and, um, and shows... And there's a bunch of duck down by the river and says, who do all these ducks belong to? So, so you know, he, he, was, he, was, he was wanting to know, you know, who, who owns all these ducks. It's God. God owns those ducks. And so... So, but, but they were there for me, and they're still there, and we're there for them. You know, they've just gone through something, and, and so, so see how that works? You, you, you got people. Get, and and, and that's, why, that's why it's so important. We need to go out and tell people, plug in, get involved in a church, get, and get your people. Get your people around you to pray with you, and, and, and be with you through those, those times. Okay, so that's first point. Second point, 
is going to be about be all in. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fiery furnace, is a picture of being all in. Would somebody agree with me there? If you're going in the fiery pit, you're all in. There's no better example of being all in than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They're all in. Regardless of, uh, they didn't care whether, whether they burnt in the fire they were in. No exits. No exit strategy. You're all in. And that that's, has to be our mentality as believers in, in the body of Christ. I'm all in. And whatever comes my way, I'm following Christ. I'm not, I'm not following... Um, I had a, a shirt we got recently that says, One Way. Jesus is One Way. It's an old, old takeoff from the Jesus People movement. So, so uh, there's, there's only one way to heaven, through Jesus. And today's culture says, oh, there's lots of ways. You can go this way, you can go that way. All leads to the same place. That's, that's not according to the Bible. And if you believe that, then you believe that Jesus told a lie because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. See how that works in there? There's one way. And... and if you need to go all in to say there's one way and be outcast by those who have their bumper stickers or whatever, <laughs> then so be it. You're all in. You're all in to your faith. You're all in to what you believe. You're all in. So how did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get there? Hey, have you ever, ever written the book of Daniel? Has anybody read the book of Daniel? Great read. It reads like theater. It, it, you know, seriously, the Old Testament stories are like, wow, you know, walls of, of water that the children of Israel walked through. That was made for theater, you know, a fiery furnace with three guys inside of it, you know, and Jesus shows up in the middle of fire. You know, God knows how to be theatrical, if you know <laughs> what I'm saying. He knows how to do it, and that's the first six chapters of Daniel, read it. It's like it's like a novel, but it's true. It's just just a great some great stories, but it but it's build your faith, it causes you to know your God better, or more. So anyway, <clears throat> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were caught in in a situation. The the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up a monument to himself, ninety feet tall, nine feet wide. I remember this old Russ Taff song. Sorry about that. <laughs> Russ, Russ Taff sang a song about 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. You know, solid gold, he must be a god. Anyway, so that's another story. Russ Taff, he's a, he's a Christian music artist way back in the 90s. So anyway, this, this statue was 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and when the music started to play, everybody in Babylon was supposed to bow towards it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no can do. And they knew that if they didn't, the fiery furnace was waiting for them because that's what the king decreed. If you don't do this, you will go into the fiery furnace. You know, um, anyway, I won't get into present-day government edicts and stuff like that. But... You know what I'm talking about. So, so if you don't do this, if you don't bow down, you're going to pay the price. You're going to pay the price. And they said, we can't disobey God. We're all in. We're all in. And the Bible says, to bring it over to the New Testament, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No matter what comes your way, you have a promise I'm all in because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can anybody say amen? amen. Say, I'm all in. I want to be more in. Okay. So the third point is lions in the den. Daniel, that, I love this story. Daniel, he's, he's up in age. 
He's served in, in three to four different administrations in Babylon as the prime minister. And, um, and these, these guys were jealous of his position, so they said, well, let's knock him off his position. So we'll make up a story about him. We'll make the king sign a, a phony law of the Medes and Persians and that can only request, re request the king's permission to do things. So they thought, and, and we know he prays, so we'll catch him praying, and then he, we'll make the king throw him in the den and, of the lions because he didn't follow the king's edict that was brought to him through trickery. So Daniel said, Daniel, he prays three times a day, right? Committed believer. He hears that, that if, if you pray to anybody but the king, you'll get thrown in the lion's den. He, I, I'd like to be a little dramatic here. He kicks his windows open and gets down on his knees so everybody can see him, and he starts praying. He's, he starts praying because he, he serves God. He, he, too, is all in. I'm trying to build something in us that has that kind of, I'm going to do what God says to do rather than what man says to do. I have this conviction that, that I'm going to follow God no matter what it looks like. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to be on fire for God. And if I fall and if I skin my knees... I'm going to do what I do with my, 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 my cell phone. I'm going to reboot the thing because the thing won't take a call. You ever notice that? If you, if you reboot your phone because it's not working, it seems to fix everything. <laughs> so anyway, why did I say that? Sometimes we need to just have a personal revival. We need to reboot ourselves. We need to say, you know, God, I'm, I'm a little bit away from you. I'm a lot away from you. I'm way far away from you. Wherever you're at, you need to every once in a while check up and see if you need a reboot and say, God, am I on fire for you? Am I, am I following you? Would I kick the windows open in front of everybody and pray? Would I? Anyway, I'm not going to go there. So anyway, <laughs> you, know, you know where we're at in our day and age. They, Christians are not real popular in this day and age. And we may need to do some things like Shadrach, Meshach, Shach, and Abednego, and Daniel. We may need to stand up, and may we, we may need to take some arrows. But, you know, it's the right thing to do. God called us to change culture. God, I really believe that God has called us to change culture. And history proves it out. Ever notice that Rome went from throwing Christians to the lions to three centuries later, the king of Rome or the emperor of Rome confessed as a Christian. How that, did that just happen? By like, oh, wow, I'm a Christian now. No, it was people who went in, who believed in Jesus' culture and kept pushing, kept pushing. In fact, the early church was called those who have changed the world. You know, I'm trying to spark inside of us a, a, a more fired up, Christianity than we've been walking in. A fired up, just people of God. And no matter what comes at us, we're going to serve God. We don't care whether you throw us in the lion's den or not. But what's interesting, the king of the time with, with um, Daniel, his name is Darius, and he, he actually prophesied to Daniel. You don't hear this much. But he prophesied to Daniel because he knew he'd been tricked. And you know what he said to him? He says, your God will deliver you before he threw him in. He says, I don't want to throw you in the den. He said, but your God will deliver you. And he went to the, to the den the very next day believing what he said was going to come. Or, or he would have said, he's gone. But he was the first one to the lion's den the, day out, the morning after because he knew. <laughs> he, Daniel convinced him to have faith in God. So much so he said, your God's going to deliver you. I know you believe what you're, 
what you believe. And I know that your God will deliver you. Went down to the lion's den the very next day, and exactly what he believed was, was true. Now, there's a bunch of things in there that you could just dissect, and all, but we're not going to do that right now. But, but he believed. And you know, in all those cases, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the story of, of the interpretation of dreams, the delivering from the lion's den, all those, all those things affected top society. They made decrees. The God of Daniel is the true and living God. From the top. So God took these four homeless Hebrew boys, brought them up and threw into the system. Now, they didn't make it happen because they're so special. They made it happen just because they followed God. You know, God's not asking you to whoop this thing up, but he is asking us to follow him with all of our hearts and, and wherever that leads us. And expect to be world changers. Yeah. To expect to be those who influence the world that God puts us in. Yeah. And that's, that's a beautiful picture of, of them affecting the world, the climate, the politics of the day. They, they, they weren't innocent bystanders. They got involved and they, beca- they, they caused a culture shift. Yeah. And I believe we can do the same. Yeah. So... You know, in your prayer time, pray along those lines if you can. And, and also, the good thing about Daniel is, is that didn't just happen. He was a praying man. And, and where's our prayer life? How many of you ever heard of John Wooden? John Wooden was a, was a basketball coach, pretty famous. And he made this statement, I make my ball players do what they don't want to do so they can be what they always wanted to be. And sometimes the Spirit of God comes, and that's why we come to church to be motivated. So, so to kind of stir us up to like cause you to do what you don't really want to do. So you can be what you know in your heart God's calling you to be. God's calling us to, to grow up in the Lord. Amen. I'll leave you with this, because you're supposed to have three points in a poem <laughs> when, you, when you preach. So... I got a poem for you. We got it up here? Uh, here we go. Got the poem. This is a great poem. It says, All the woulda, coulda, shouldas lying in the sun. Talking about things they woulda, coulda, shoulda done. You can just picture these guys in sunglasses looking cool, you know. Remind, reminds me of some Christians. You know, I woulda, I coulda, I shoulda. You know, they're just, they're just chilling. They're talking about things they would have, could have, should have done. But all those would have, could have, should have, all ran away and hid from one little did. So, so the Bible verse I want to leave you with is, is James 1.22. It says, prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. But prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers. And if you're just a merely hearer, woulda, coulda, shoulda. And if you're just a, a merely a hearer and not a doer of the word, you don't even need the devil to deceive you. You've just deceived yourself. You know, this, this is, we're playing for keeps. Hope that, that, you know, that's a little bit blunt, but this is the kingdom of God, and, and we can do, God says you can do things do the word. So I want to give you a simple illustration. Use me as the, is, is the example of kind of a situation because I've worked through this stuff. I wouldn't preach it if it didn't work. At least I hope so. Um, so here, uh, how many of you guys have ever s- cussed? <laughs> and, 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 and ever s- swore? Use the Lord's name in vain. All those things. Okay, so, so this is practical. Be a doer of the word. I'm getting practical here. So, so I, I, I had a pretty colorful language at one time. And, and God started dealing with me concerning my language, my foul mouth. And um, I was to be a doer of the word, right? Remember what 
verse. So, so it, the Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. So, and I had a bunch of it coming out. <laughs> so so th- then I, I said, you know what? And you're not going to do this in your own power. You've you got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've got, you, you got the living God living inside of you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And we're not asking you to be works Christian. We're asking you to get in touch with the Spirit of God inside of you. Let Him work it from the inside out. The Bible calls us uh, rivers of living water are to come out of our bellies. So if you've got water of life coming out of you, it's, it's, it's gushing stuff out of you. And nothing can get in you if, if stuff's flowing out of you. You see what I'm saying? So you, you have help. For, for whatever situation you're, you're trying to grow in the Lord in, you've got help. Yeah. Yeah, this is not a, a works religion thing. You know, th- you, you know, they used to do that. They used to whip themselves, you know, to get, beat themselves into submission or whatever it was. The religions of the days gone past. That's not what God does. In fact, the Holy, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He comes along, he comes along and he convicts the world of sin. You can read this in your Bible in there. He convicts the world of sin, but you know he convicts believers? He convicts us of righteousness. Amen. You know, he convicts those guys of sin. Us, he says, you're better than that. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You, you have a higher level. You're, you're living below your potential. And, and he doesn't condemn you. There's therefore no condemnation for those in Christ. He's telling you, you're, I've made you righteous. You have this position. Now you just need, you know, like your parents used to buy you too big of shoes and you grew into it. That's what God does. You know, you're, you know he convicts you of righteousness. Even though you don't fit into it right now, you will. You will. So back to my cousin story. So... <laughs> So I would, just, I would just say, God, I just don't want to cuss anymore. I just want, to, I want my mouth cleaned up. And so I, would just, I just did it um, little by little as he helped me. And, I, and every t- I just decided I'm going to hold myself accountable to the Lord. Every time something comes, slips out of my mouth, I would, just, I, would, I would say, Father, I'm sorry. Please help me. Energize me. And I grew out of that, that problem. And everything in your life will be that way. You, you got a river of life flowing out of you that will push that stuff out if you let it. You can, you can walk in the newness of life. And um, <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that Ben's going to do Renewing the Mind less next week, right? And so, so stay tuned. So that's about all I got for you today.